Hello, friends. In this episode, I interview Liam Bright. He is an assistant professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and he lectures about uh, philosophy of science. Also, he lectures about critical race theory. And so I was able to get some really sort of different perspectives from him about uh, things I've spoken with others uh, about in the past. And we start off talking about uh, his particular interest in the logical positivist movement, how that is uh, different, but sometimes somewhat similar to postmodernism. Sorry, Liam, if I got that totally wrong, but he does explain more in the actual interview. It's interesting. We we go into some cool stuff about his views on how to solve problems, the way that the sort of IDW movement has brought up sort of the policy and political stuff mixed in with philosophy. And it's, he, guys, he brings up some really cool points. So I am really interested in what you think about this one. And if you have questions, please put them uh, in the comments uh, for Liam specifically, because I do want to interview him again, because I didn't get to go over some things, particularly about critical race theory, that I would really like to hear more of his perspective on. So yes, any uh, sort of questions or comments, please leave them in uh, all the comments section. And yeah, I think that uh, I'm going to let you get to the interview now because it's a really good one. And I have to note, I force a compliment on him at the very end, which I came to realize after is not something traditionally done across the pond in the UK. So... I apologize for that, Liam. Um, I will be more culturally sensitive in the future. Hello, Liam. Hi, Andrea. How's it going? So far, so good. I very nearly forgot your name, which would have oh, been a good. really oh, awkward God. way to begin this. So. I know, but so like, I'm feeling like I'm facing it so far. Well, when we're... No, yeah, you're good. Actually, you pronounced it properly as well, Andrea, because... There's been some mis misunderstandings about how to pronounce my name. So, anyways, yeah, um, it's hard because like we're Twitter friends. So when we see people come up on Twitter, sometimes you don't even read the name; you just see the little avatar, and you're like, "Oh, that person," and you just do. Well, quick. no, I think of you as the one with the bangs. Yes, so, that's my main thing. Yeah, yeah. So, and Andrea was totally. I'm sorry, barbarian Americans are mispronouncing it, but. Oh, no. <laughs> It, no, but you, you it's fringe to you guys, though, right? Yes, no, that's why bang stands out to me. Yes, like okay, yeah. yeah, in in the, it, well, it's a noun, I use it as a noun anyway, so <laughs> my husband's like, should you have that? <laughs> I'm like, they know, my uh, Twitter friends know me, anyway, so fringe to all those who are watching across the pond for me and across the way for you. Anyway, okay, so the reason why I wanted to talk with you is because I see you doing, um, well, I mean, you're, you do, you're, you're a philosophy man, but also you sometimes poke... I'm philosophy man? Yeah, you're a philosophy <laughs> man to me. Superhero. Okay. okay. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're a superhero of philosophy man. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's what? awesome. Yeah. I didn't even think of it. It sounds like that. Well, you are. That is your superhero name, is Philosophy Man. You could have that be your Twitter name if you like, if you want to ever mix it up. I, uh, uh, I grant permission. So, yeah. So, okay. The reason why I particularly wanted to chat with you um, is because I often see you, I don't know, kind of like poke fun at like the, uh, like, what is it? The postmodern neo Marxist sort of idea and you're like yeah that's me <laughs> yes. so can you like can you go into that a bit sure thing sure thing so um as i'm sure listeners are aware but just to get everyone on this viewers viewers or listeners how do you refer to um, the people i think you could say either i mean it's subscribers for youtube but listeners if it's the podcast oh, so. mm -hmm. okay 
So um, as uh, subscribers are no doubt aware, um, Jordan Peterson, I think primarily, but now other people too, have this line where they describe people in academia, maybe the humanities especially, as doing what they call postmodern neo-Marxism, or like that's kind of the ideology people are said to adhere to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And roughly speaking, this idea is meant to be sort of a, a melding of two things, the kind of the, the, the Marxist idea that kind of the proletariat are going to going to rise up and and uh, administer the world for their own purposes mm -hmm. and the postmodern idea i don't really know at that point like I don't, something like there's no truth it's very vague yeah, yes yeah some... like there's no absolutes everything's something a social like construct yeah and, and and like the and typically academics get rather annoyed at this because um well, because in postmodernism and marxism are thought of as kind of rival ideologies which I don't don't like each other. Mm -hmm. Now, if if you, I, I've now heard enough of what Jordan Peterson and some others have to say that typically they have a response to that. Like they're aware that this rivalry exists, so they're mm -hmm. not like that. But in any case, it usually annoys academics because you know anyone who self identifies with either the label postmodern, which is pretty rare nowadays, or the label Marxist, which is rare but less rare, they typically don't like the other lot, and so don't like being lumped in with them. Right. And I'm, you know, my life now is i'm very online i'm on twitter and this is a terrible thing about me but there we go and the result of that is too. we're both terrible then <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's awful yeah and, and so now what i do is you know, so now that sort of prompted me to be the kind of person who just well i'm going to identify with the label like that okay that's, you're uh, trolling yeah i'm just trolling it's that that's like there is a serious point underneath it and i can explain the serious okay point, i would love to hear primarily it. it's you know if if everyone thinks it's bad to be x then that's at least some argument for for being x on twitter okay. so um um a, a lot of it's that uh i should maybe say a bit um i presume no one will know who i am so i'm a uh, philosophy person. I know I called the... you philosophy man, and like that's it. So yeah, sure. Please give me your background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should, see, what I should have you know, done that. <laughs> what you know, I, I, you know, what you people normally by day, I'm a mild mannered professor at the LSE <laughs> philosophy, but you know what I do? Then I take my comb out of my hair, and no one can recognize me, and I fly around and save cats from trees or whatnot. But um, <laughs> typically, I've got my comb in at least. I'm I'm a mild mannered um, philosophy. Or lecturer, we'd say in the UK, assistant professor at London School of Economics, and what I focus on is kind of the philosophy of science. Thinking about how does science work, how should it work, what, how can we make it work better, and how can we use the results of science to uh, to better our society. Um, and within the sort of the history of my discipline, philosophy of science, there was this this movement called logical positivism or logical empiricism. And on Twitter, I call myself the last positivist because I really like them. I, I think they had a lot of important, interesting things to say. And I think an interesting thing about them is that they're very kind of sciencey. I don't know how to put it. They have this kind of aesthetic of of mathematical rigor and respect for the sciences. Um, and it's more than aesthetic. It's almost part of what they were trying to do. Who, um, can you give me a few names, philosophers? Sure. So if people want to look it up, there's uh, Rudolf Carnap is my favorite. He's one of the most famous. You've been tweeting about him recently? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Moritz Schlick was another one. Uh, uh, Hans Reichenbach, Karl Hempel. There's largely Germanic sounding names because that's where they were in sort of Central Europe and okay. Germany. Austria. Um, and actually, I guess famous people like neither Wittgenstein nor Godel were one of them, but it kind of hung around with them. They're in the same social circles. Okay. And so it was kind of a movement of very influential intellectuals in the early 20th century. And I really like them. And they have this kind of sciencey thing. But they also, I mean, they were they were socialists or in some cases Marxists. So they've got the Marxist bit. And and I think this is, goes against people's stereotypes. Precisely because of their respect for the sciences, they ended up endorsing what sound like some quite postmodernist ideas where they were quite relativistic. They more or less said everything's a social construction. Okay. And so I think it's kind of interesting that when people have sort of taken these very sciencey ideas seriously, and at least some cases they've ended up coming to conclusions which sound a lot more like, you know, the kind of people John P Peterson's very, very, very angry at. Yeah. So yeah. it's part of the reason I'm sort of identifying the label is to give me a chance to talk about my my favorite nerdy philosophers so. okay okay that's okay so what are some of the 
the logical positivism is their their sort of movement. Yeah. But that sounds not postmodern at all. <laughs> no, and everyone listening to this who in any way likes the positivists or the postmodernists will hate me for saying this. So hopefully you're going to get like nerdy hate mail. Okay, but um, wait, but so so you're you've noticed a few things that you're saying kind of sound postmodern-ish of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and go through and see what I mean. So okay. a, a, a bit of background and why I think that leads to the, the similarities. So what, what was going on with them is they were they were very impressed by um, new scientific theories at the uh, in the early 20th century. So um, new work in the foundations of mathematics, which is trying to use logic to derive everything. And also um, new work in physics, which like Einstein had just mm. done as well. It's a big deal. And they became kind of quite enamored with, they, they were thinking a lot about how, do, what's the role of kind of mathematics and logic in all of this? How, how, do, how do these mathematical tools fit into our understanding of the world? And not all of them, but a prominent stand of them started thinking of these things as more or less kind of conventions we adopt to help us coordinate in how we discuss with each other. So... Why is it true, say, that like the kind of logical systems we use, where, for instance, there can't be any true contradictions, that's often the thing people say in logic, that if you have it's raining, it can't also be not raining at the same time in the same way. That's impossible. Okay. So they thought, like, why is that? What does that it's impossible mean? And the decision they came to is that it's actually a reflection of ways we've resolved to talk to each other, that we kind of have adopted rules for communication, which like make la- that... Like in language? Like in language, right? It's, it's like a sort of a convention in English that we can't, if you've said it's raining, it's now impermissible to say it's not raining in the same way at the same time. That's kind of a, a faux pas in some sense. Okay. And they thought that would help make sense of how it is that, for instance, like that sounds a bit weird when you put it like that, but it's meant to explain things like, you know, in physics or in sort of cosmology, they make use of like mathematical theories where they'll use geometry to describe space time. And then you can sort of do pure mathematics, which seems to describe the world. And that was you'd be puzzling. How comes like you can sit in your room and prove some theorems and that tells you about space, the world outside? That seems odd. Don't you have to go out and do experiments with evidence? How is it that you can just use pure reason to right. uncover the world? Well, how? And, and, well, and this was their answer. Their answer is because you're not really. Because what's going on is it's a convention we're using to help us describe the results of our physical experiments or frame our predictions but you know it's not really a fact about the outside world it's more it's a it's there's rules of a game we've all agreed to play in order to do physics right and it's symbols and it's uh meaning attached to the symbols and it's uh, the way in which we understand okay exactly right so that was their answer and okay. then but once you grant that answer and i think it's at least a kind of it's obviously it's controversial but it's, it's a defensible way of understanding what's going on they drew out that that actually allows for quite a heavy degree of relativism. Like if it's just a convention, well, you can permissibly adopt a different convention. You don't have to speak the way we're speaking. You could speak in a different way. Okay, this is starting to sound a little postmodern now, and I'm starting to see this because the language thing is is to do with the postmodernists and whatnot. So, okay. So that's exactly the connection. So once they sort of admitted that, oh, well, it's a convention, and of course it can be a better or worse convention. It's not that anything goes. It might be more or less useful or convenient as a way of talking Mm -hmm. but like that's that's the rules of the game here it's quite useful or convenient rather than true or false right Um, yeah and then we're in the sort of world of like well maybe it's useful for this purpose but it wouldn't serve some of our other purposes so for instance i have a paper this is going to sound very postmodern because i think that's where they were but as far as i can tell they for instance they were all in well they were in austria and germany largely in the run-up to the Nazis taking over. And they were largely driven out. Some of them were killed, but they were, you know, it didn't go well for them when the Nazis took over. Well, because they, like, the Nazis were like, we like to know that what we think is right. And so let's not deconstruct our Aryan race thing. (laughs) Well, actually, yes, actually, because, so one of the other ideas they were famous for is is that um, to be meaningful, a claim I've asked to be kind of maths, you know, we were just discussing, or has to be such that kind of you could get evidence which would prove it true or disprove it. Now, you know, the Nazis were keen on saying things like, we, the Aryan race, have a great destiny. And, you know, that there's no evidence you can get for that, right? It's just, it's just a kind of... Um, it's an idea, yeah. Just, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, 
And the Nazis weren't so keen on these intellectuals, many of whom were Jewish, saying, I don't think that means anything. Um, So, you know, it didn't go well for them when the Nazis Mm -hmm. took over. And as far as I can tell, they responded to that, actually, um, by more or less saying that we should drop the convention which makes race talk meaningful. Like, we should just stop speaking about people in terms of, like, white, black, whatever. The postmodernists Uh, said? No, this is a, no, the no. My favorite, the sciencey people said that because oh. they thought like the only thing that makes it true that you know you're white, uh, for instance. I'm, I'm guessing, Andrea, not to assume. Mm, that's okay. No, uh, how dare you assume yeah. my ethnic background, <laughs> sir? I have been called eth- ethnically ambiguous though in the past. You, you know, you're ethnically ambiguous enough that I hesitated when I said <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. No, I am Caucasian. As far as I know, I need to do yeah, a twenty-three in me, but so, we'll see. I'll let you know. what makes it that you're caucasian is partly of course the facts about who your parents were um but also partly that we have this linguistic convention that people with certain traits like for instance who your parents were we categorize them as caucasian Mm. and they thought that given their experience of what had what happened with kind of racism in germany that this was such a disaster that we should just stop doing it we would refuse to do that and then the the positivists the logical positivists thought this okay So this is what I this is what I've argued in any case in a historical paper, and so the reason I raise that is because I mean I I don't actually think that's a good idea, but that, that was their response to this. Okay. Um, but it just goes to show that you know these were people who I haven't gone into it here, but I hope people can take my word and look it up. No one could have could accuse them of not liking science or being anti reason or anything like right. that. Very very far from it. They were okay. kind of really trying to defend science and rationality and reason in their day. But if you look at the conclusions they come up to and some of the things they recommend in light of that, it does sound a lot like what people nowadays really don't like as kind of bad postmodernism. And and I think that's really interesting in the present culture war context because it mm-hmm. sees you can come at these ideas from lots of perspectives and maybe not all of them will be ones which you dislike so much. You know? Well, that's what I actually, that leads me to ask why the obsession, I shouldn't say obsession, but I suppose in academia, I mean, if we're looking at the broader world, there's not a giant obsession with the postmodernists, but <laughs> online and in Twitter <laughs> and people who have watched Jordan Peterson, because we've heard of that. That's where I first heard about postmodernism was watching him. And then and then in academia, I would say quite a bit. Why are they so obsessed with postmodernists? Why not these logical positivists if they kind of come through to some of similar conclusions, but maybe a little bit more considering science? Well, I can say a few things. Um, firstly, to no one's uh, misled, outside of my heart where the positivists reign forever, the logical positivists are usually thought to be a widely and badly discredited movement. People think that it was sort of, people really don't agree with it. So... I am a deeply unrepresentative person in my attitude towards them. So largely people don't pay attention to them because they're just viewed as people who are like wrong and shown to have been wrong. And so that's, that's that. Okay, but why? Why were they labeled wrong? So, um, so largely, largely what the way they try to sort of uh, prosecute their arguments or put their claims forward was they argued that the only, as I said, the only way to say meaningful claims about the world, you have to either be doing basically, let me get this right, the only way to say things which can be true or false, you have to be saying things which are either mathematically provable in some sense, or which you can like put get scientific evidence for or against. Okay. Now, you might do other things with your language. You know, if I'm at a football match and I like what just happened, I might say, yay, I wouldn't say yay, that would be very pathetic, but you get the general idea. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, and who am I kidding? I would say yay. You would right. say yay! I would say yay too. Okay. Um, but, you know, but you know, and that's not, you know, saying yay, it's not true or false. It's not really the right way to evaluate that kind of utterance. But right. it's, it's clearly meaningful in some sense. You're putting forward your attitude and it's appropriate in the context. Mm-hmm. So they were fine with that, of course. But... They thought in order to be true, there has to be a way of like showing it to be true, roughly, or giving it evidence that it would it be true. It sounds hard. A, it's very hard. It rules out a lot of things which intuitively people think are meaningful. I mean, most famously, they, for instance, argued that uh, 
many religious claims they thought were simply neither true nor false. And most people think it's, look, maybe there is a God, maybe there isn't a God, but it's true or false that there's a God. It can't just be meaningless. Right. So well, there's a lot of the scientists who don't think, who, who are like, well, it's not falsifiable, so we don't even go there. Isn't that, is that not true? Well, so I think there's, it's kind of a stronger claim because they're not just saying that, for instance, well, there might be a God, we just can't know. They were um, saying it, there's no such thing, like the statement there is a God is apparently saying something about the world, but in fact, it can't even be true or false. It's not just it can't be shown to be false. It's not just falsifiable. It, it couldn't be false because the, the very fact that we can't come to know whether it's true or false means that there's no real statement there. So it's kind of like if I say colorless green ideas sleep furiously, I've grammatically said something which sounds like a sentence, but colorless green ideas sleep furiously, it's it's not really a sentence in English. It just doesn't mean right, anything. Right. And they're like they the cause of his claim was statements like there is a God. Um that statements like that are just like colorless green ideas sleep furiously. They seem like they're saying a sentence, but they don't even they don't even write and people view that to be too strong. Like, okay, that, that is right. I think even I think even Dawkins himself would be like yes. that's far. Yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. Right. This is yeah, it's more extreme than Dawkins in it. Yeah, regard. yeah, which is like and saying I, and something. Gets, yeah. Yeah. And, and and it gets worse for them because consider the sentence every meaningful claim is either mathematically provable or you can give scientific evidence in favor of it. That very sentence is not mathematically provable, nor is there scientific evidence you give in favor of it. And so it sounds like their core idea fails its own test. It it reminds me so, of the absolute, like there there's no absolute truth. And it's like, are you saying that absolutely? Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. That, exactly. That kind of like self-referential paradox yeah. was to sort of undercut them. And well, so, can they, can they be these, tweaked these... though? Like, can they not? Can you tweak them and like make them? Can you, you know, people come along and be like, okay, so here's where they had it right. I'm going to take that and do a new, um, logical, extra positivist. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, so I think in contemporary philosophy, as I say, it's largely discredited. Um, but insofar as that there are people who are still sympathetic, that often I was just hanging out, for instance, with a with a philosopher and biologist in um, in Japan in Kyoto, and nice. he was. You went to Japan? Oh, I wanted to ask you about that, but we can do that later. Okay. <laughs> yes, my fiance is Japanese, so um, I learned just enough uh, Japanese to say "gomenasai." Nippongo ga wakarimasen, which means I'm sorry, I don't speak Japanese, and like, that's all I can do. <laughs> but um, so I, I went to Kyoto and I met up with this philosopher who's also working on some biological projects. And you know, he was saying to me that while he doesn't agree with logical processes, he's kind of he's sympathetic to the spirit of their trying to make things okay. clear. And I think that has lived on a bit. Like some people sort of admire them and they try and sort of work in the same spirit, but they don't agree with exactly their doctrines. I actually, I, I think it might be going too deep into things, but I actually think a stronger thing, I think we can just do the original thing, you know, make logical buzzers and great again. So. Oh, but, oh gosh, but, but you just gave the sentence that un was their undoing. So it does need some <laughs> yeah. tweaks. Okay, from from the yeah. lay person to philosopher yeah. man. <laughs> That's fair, you know, like <laughs> the mere fact that I'm obviously wrong has not ever stopped me before and gosh darn it, it's not going to stop me now. But okay. no, I, I mean, I just think it can be repaired. I think there's sort of there are okay. technical things you have to avoid the okay. the immediate reputation. But it, putting a pin, so that that's why people nowadays largely think it's just kind of discredited. So that's one reason people don't talk about it. Okay, okay. Another reason people don't talk about it, but talk more about the postmodernists, is that weirdly, a kind of a strange thing happened where. The, the logical process I just mentioned were kind of, you know, they were sort of straightforward socialists. Like okay. they were involved in the socialist movement in 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 Europe, um, and when they came to America, I mean, some of them they were targeted actually by McCarthy quite a lot. So some right. of them just stopped what they were doing because the FBI were on their trail. But others of them kept involved. Like I mentioned, Rudolf Carnap. Actually, he was very well. He was involved in the civil rights movement in America when he came here. So like, oh, okay. they they were kind of old-fashioned leftists. 
But that's not really, I think, what most people in the sort of contemporary culture world scene are worried about. Like, that's not, that's, you know, when the IDW are fighting the culture, the, their side of the culture world, they're not really worried about kind of old school socialism. That's just not enough of a social force for it to be scary, I think. Right. They're more worried about people kind of uh, who have what they take to be, I don't think entirely accurately, mind you, but what they take to be the sort of the dominant ideology in sort of, critical studies humanities departments the applied postmodernism is what they call that yeah. yeah and 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 that and that's just kind of it that comes out of a different intellectual tradition if anything that kind of comes out of the intellectual tradition the positivists would take to be enemies with and so partly they just don't talk about it because they don't see it as as bearing on the fight they're having they're having a different fight okay so why are those who are and I think I'm, I don't remember if I maybe you answered this and I missed it but why are people enamored in academia more with the postmodern movement? You did answer this. Wait. Oh, no, no, I didn't. I mean, I only very so, briefly... Okay, so, so why, why, even though there were those critiques that you gave me, there's also critiques of postmodernism. So, but that doesn't stop a lot of people in academia to really like the postmodernists. Is it because they're, is it because they like, it's easy, they like, it's easy to like something that tears everything down, whereas the logical positivists weren't tearing things down necessarily, like they were kind of mixing things, I guess they were kind of tearing down, but not in the way that postmodernists were. Well, I I think basically the, the answer to this is I'm going to reject the presupposition. I think in contemporary academia, the kind of the the people who are sort of the big postmodernist theorists, mm -hmm. they're also largely rejected. Like it's it's not the case nowadays. If you were go to go into the humanities, people would say, "Yes, I'm just doing the kind of Derridian playfulness with concepts from the 1980s." In in exactly this, in, in almost for the reasons you're saying, people did come to believe that look, this is just tearing things down. It's not clear it's going anywhere. Like what what are we oh, up to here? It's the bubble I'm in. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, so. I think insofar as it's more of a connection, what it is, is the people who are working nowadays will trace outside of philosophy of science where I work, will more often trace their roots back to like to like that group of people. So they will say, like, I'm not doing the same thing, but like I I, I recognize them as ancestors. OK, because so, like, yes, I, I did speak with um, like with Helen and with uh, Jim, Lindsay and Mike Nana about the yeah. origins and they do they do kind of that yeah ancestral but the postmodernists do sorry the applied postmodernists do sort of say that they, they, they're like well we're not them but that's our ancestors i think that they would admit that i don't know yes but they would identify well, I think, with that i don't I, you know i guess you have to ask them but my my sense is that they'll just be viewed as people who like we learned something from them and now we've moved on would be right. the relationship. The next to iteration of that. Yeah. I don't know. Cause that, that might suggest more continuity than they really feel. Because like, I think one of the big things the postmodernists did, which is very like, not, there's something kind of irreverent about postmodernism, right? Like the style of thought, which it encouraged is very kind of like, under, like mocking things. There's maybe a purpose to that. It's like, showing up the pretenses of things which take themselves altogether too seriously and which right. purport to have foundations which they couldn't possibly have. Right. So like that is so the not the mocking things has a purpose, but it is kind of in the end like playful. Right. Um, like, oh so the, playful. Like, Nothing has meaning. It's all a construct. Yes. You know, bit so of fun. Kind of lulls. But no, you know, now that that's not I should say like that was never the it, you, one shouldn't treat these things as a monolith either. Like right. there are differences between what Foucault was doing versus what Deleuze was doing, and you know, and, and, and so they're not the same versus what Derrida was doing. Right. So that that generation of thinkers weren't doing the same thing. It's just it in many ways it's 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 just not the dominant thing nowadays. So, but I, as I said, I, I think that people um, recognize that nowadays. And so as I was actually listening to a bunch of, I think I actually listened to your um, interview of Helen Pluckrose and I listened to some other intros of Helen Pluckrose and some other people. And I think nowadays if, when they talk, they'll acknowledge that and they'll say, you know, like the people aren't doing the same thing. It's an ancestral thing. But I don't even agree with the characterization of the contemporary scene either. Okay. I, I'm just not convinced 
I strongly disagree with the idea that um, that what's happened is you know the tools of reason and rationality are to be dismissed as the as the white man's tools or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I, I I think again like that happy for it. There's a term I, I I heard on Twitter, which is nut picking, and I don't like the term in its full implications. But roughly, is the idea is it nut picking or nitpicking? No, nut picking, and with, with a you, you. Um, oh, see, I've heard nit picking. No, 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 nut picking. And here, the idea is that suppose I say, you know, I don't know, the IDW is full of people with just terrible haircuts. And someone would to say to someone say, like, Liam, that's ridiculous. What do you mean the IDW is full of people's ter- ter- terrible haircuts? I could go, excuse me, and then gather some Twitter profiles with IDW people with terrible haircuts and say, like, well, here they are. You, you doubt me? And the idea is just that the internet is a big enough place with enough pe- variety of people that basically for any generalization you want to make, you'll be able to find some instances. Okay. So the idea is like that, that's, that's the sort of the idea behind the claim. So I realized that what I'm about to say here is very genre, vulnerable to being counter nut picked. Cause I'm sure you could find some people saying that, I don't know, you know, maths is for the white man is bad therefore. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm sure yeah. those people exist, but those people are sort of like a, a deeply not representative of, I think what you would see just in a, in either actually typical, certainly in typical academia, but even I think in a typical kind of politi- political activist movement inspired by humanist trends in the academy. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that, I think, is actually nothing deep. It's just because most people don't care. Like m- most people's conception of politics, they're not really concerned about um, the ultimately what is the source of the authority of arithmetic in society that's that's a high level thing no one cares about mm-hmm. people are interested in you know uh, what are the policies in my workplace for sexual harassment and things like that right and it just it kind of just doesn't come up like and so i think it's, it's, it's a bit of a misrepresentation that this is what it is that these kind of activist movements uh, are involved in and i think it's a misrepresentation which is motivated by the fact that you know it's just a bit wacky right it's, it's a somewhat wacky claim that uh, whether two plus two equals four is that two plus two equals four is somehow sort of oppressive. And so if you can find someone saying that who seems to disagree with you, you, you focus on them because it's not picking. It's it's like, aha, got you. Okay. Okay. And, but it's just like we we would all do better as a as a as a discourse if, you know, those people should be engaged with, often they're putting forward arguments and you should listen to their arguments and respond. But they they should they don't really deserve the status as like the central focus of of IDW activism because they're just not a big social deal. I, 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 okay, I, because I they're finding the few who say the like, you know, oh, I'm so ashamed of my whiteness. I sure, try to exactly. have penance every day, right. or you know, or, or those things. The, the people who say those sort of statements. Uh, right. Yeah. I, I think we. Both, you might even be thinking of the same thing I saw. There was it was a celebrity of some sort, I believe, on Twitter the other day, who who she did tweet out that you know I am ashamed of my whiteness. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, so, and as far as I can tell, there were two groups of people responding to this. One, um, people of color, to put it broadly, being like, you don't need to do that. Like, this, this is weird. This is not really useful to anyone. And two, um, people who like sort of don't like the it poll crowd saying like, aha, we told you this is what it leads to. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of, you know, everyone involved here was wasting their time, more or less. Like this one person making this kind of, I don't, I don't want to be cruel to them. I'm, I'm sure they had their reasons for thinking this was a thing worth tweeting, but it seemed a bit unwise and it didn't it didn't really seem like it was going to help anything good. And largely insofar as I, 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 I've got, you know, <laughs> I've got lots of proverbial black friend, black friends and Asian friends. And <laughs> insofar as we responded, you know, we were all saying things like, you know, this ain't it. Like, this is not a good use of your time. I, right. I don't know why you. And on the other hand, people being like, aha, this is where it leads. Don't do it. To some extent, you know, insofar as all the people of color I know were saying this is a bad idea. Don't do it. It's right to say don't do it. I agree. I was one of those people of color. But it's not it was kind of a waste like it's just not representative this is one weird person doing one weird thing and we we wasted an afternoon which we could have been using on much more productive tweets okay okay i okay i agree to an extent because i have thought about this it's it is it isn't 
if you're off Twitter, and I've even heard people say this, like when you go off Twitter, see, that's my place, but and I think yours too, but like social media or whatever videos that we're watching and you just interact with people, most, most people aren't concerned with these things. But you, and not necessarily people creeping into administrations with the critical race, like, you know, theory degree who are going to be like, I'm going to employ this in like, like not necessarily like that, but there are these sort of ways of, oh, this is what, this is what the young people are saying is the next civil rights thing. Okay, yeah, we'll just, we'll do that. We'll, or like, I mean, I'm, they're not saying this is what the young people, but like, this is where the way of the future is. I want to be on the right side of history. You know, I think, like, just, um, just little, uh, like, there's one woman complained about a phrase on a set of plates at Macy's on Twitter. She mm. complained about it, and Macy's pulled it. And they're like, we're so sorry. You know, so 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 that's not that that is an indicative of our age, and it is like something that wouldn't have happened in the past. You know, th there are just little like things going in to government policy, not necessarily policy, but like going in. You just hear, like I think, what did Kamala Harris do? No, no, it wasn't Kamala Harris. Elizabeth Warren tweeted something out about deconstructing racism or something it, it sounded like that theory the theory well so and let me a couple of things firstly you know i actually um to use a twitter mode of speech you know critical race theory is good actually um but um by this i mean like i think one of the things to 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 sort of to try and avoid in the discourse and in which i think would lead to a much healthier political scene in North America, it's a bit different in Europe, but in North America, where this is very prominent and cultural, um, is to sort of avoid the overfocus on kind of the least reasonable version of any theory, okay. because most of the time it's 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 just it doesn't even not I think even I'm one of the critical race theorists, so us critical race theorists, we're not largely saying things like we must like stop everyone writing city plates in Macy's, whatever. We largely don't care. Right. Like, I mean, so, so to take the example, which I think even most IDW people agree is perfectly fine, and it's usually, it's kind of the thing which Kimberly Crenshaw used to illustrate with intersectionality theory. It's like one of the central cases. She's a legal theorist, so she was focusing on legal cases. And it was a case where, um, it was General Motors, I believe. Have, have you, well, no, I'll I say again for this. Um, so, um, Basically, some black women filed a class action lawsuit against General Motors, alleging that they'd been last hired, first fired. It was agreed on the facts of the case that this was true. However, the judge ruled that um, women could not be said to be last hired, first fired, because white women were not last hired, first fired. I have heard was... this is the one case that, like, yes, this actually is where intersectionality did make sense because black women were targeted. Exactly. Right. And, but in, importantly, like what happened was the law as it, had, as it had been framed was in terms of women as a class and black people as a class. And for that reason, Crenshaw was like, look, the judge ruled correctly in light of the law. But that just shows that we need to think about things better and have a better understanding of how to frame these kind of laws. Because we're not achieving our own goals in terms of anti-bigotry. Anti and, you know, whether or not you... Now, one can then argue about how, what, what kind of form the law should take. And most academics, that's what we're doing. We're arguing about things like that. Yeah. But it's kind of, it's it's very unfair to characterize that kind of argument as the same thing as, I, I, you know, silly okay. phrases on the matrix. I do feel bad because I'm not the grievance studies scholar, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I've just spoken yeah. with them. But, but I do, to be fair, I do remember them giving Crenshaw of all of the critical race theorists that they have named i think that robin d'angelo is the one that they're concerned one of the ones that they're concerned the most about um she, she's a backpack right I, I don't know her as well tell the truth. okay well she so I, I think she was the like i don't remember Ugh, see that's the thing i'm not i don't i don't remember no, all sure. that. but but and like bell hooks is another one 
the ones that say white people are racist no matter what white if if you are trying to be if you are just going about your business being right doing your thing you're 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 contributing towards the system and you're being racist just by not being concerned about it and like having it in your mind but even if you are trying to you know deconstruct is white hetero patriarchy whatever even if you're trying to go for that you're doing it just to get in good with people of color so then you'll be like one of the good ones going to the good a good white and then oh well so then you're racist there because you have these selfish motives of trying to like whatever so so there are some theorists that come came up with that and I don't know 100% which ones they were, but they did say Crenshaw wasn't the one that came up with that. I, I, I'm i pretty sure they they don't... I Okay, from what I remember, they said that for Crenshaw, they did say that it's been taken in directions she doesn't necessarily like like the, with, with her, her intersectionality. So I think I've heard them say that. They've been kind of like give give her a bit of credit, I think. Um, as far as all of the critical race theorists, she's the one that I, I remember them saying that, but like, that's the thing is, I, 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 I have a, I have a degree in Christian studies and a minor in history, man. Like I didn't take any of these classes. <laughs> so, so but that's why I don't know I'll, all I've, and this is why I wanted to talk with you because all I've heard about these things, and I don't necessarily think that, um, like that. James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose and Peter Bogosian have, so they're kind of separate from the IDW, like the, the sorry, the Grievance Studies crew. They haven't been trying to, you know, be nef like nefarious and like, oh, watch out, you know. I don't think that they have. They're they're legitimately concerned, um, but that's all I've heard about it, about these these uh, theorists, right? So I haven't heard of the like, oh, that's maybe the worst possible meaning you can read into that, you know, I, 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 as far as I know, that's just what regular mainstream is. Right. So, I, yeah, so my, my take is this is kind of the least possible. So to take some, some of the ideas you just discussed, I, I, I couldn't speak to what those particular theorists' names were saying, but maybe some people out there, I'm sure you could find some, are saying that, you know, I, I know what any given white person is thinking when they try and do anti-racist things. Really, they have this kind of selfish motive. And so for that reason, I'll to be condemned. Maybe someone is saying that. And, you know, I would agree, you know, there's no possible way you could know what every given person is thinking and doing. That's very implausible as a theory. So that doesn't sound good, right? So I disagree that's bad. On the other hand, you know, I, I think that it's easy to kind of get people worked into a panic about statements like, well, probably all of us are complicit in bad systems. And so to that degree, are like, you know, we're doing a bad thing by putting them forward. It, with, with a decent analysis of what complicity means, I realize that can actually be quite a slippery phrase. Mm. But, you know, like it seems plausible to me, for instance, that, uh, I don't know, so um, I make use of uh, various kinds of automobiles and getting around the place. That's very punzi. I mean, I, I, I get cars and buses. Um, that oil will often be drawn from, you know, from Shell BP. Mm -hmm. um, Shell BP like, you know, the history of Nigeria, it's not the case that Shell BP have the oil in Nigeria because there were some fair trades, right? It's not, right. that's just because they were back in a day and took it. Okay. And so like, to some extent, like, you know, I am funding these people who just stole that stuff and still maintain little mercenary armies to steal stuff in Nigeria, as far as I can tell. Okay. And so if you were to say to me, like, you know, Liam, whatever your intents and purposes are, you are de facto an imperialist in virtue of the fact that you give these people your money. Okay. Like, look, I mean, it's kind of that's not an unreasonable point of view. Like I, I understand what the person's saying, and it's not wrong. Like I am actually giving them their money, and to that degree, I am actually helping prop up what amounts to a legacy of colonialism. So I think there's often when people say things like, you know, uh, white people are racist, and then what will be explained by, well, what happens is, is you know, one goes to an interview, and it counts in your favor that your name doesn't sound stereotypically black. That's not, of course, something you chose. That can't be the fair accusation. But it is the case something one, one benefits from, and you, you know, do send in your CV. You know, insofar as that kind of thing is true, it sounds to me it's quite similar to like Liam, your Liam, you are sort of participating in Shell BP's operation. And right or wrong, one can debate what the upshot of that is, or whether that's a good way of looking at things. It's not just a kind of it's not the same kind of thing as like imputing psychological motives to every white person, which of course is un implausible, right? Because because how could we know what every white person is thinking? That that's not very good. Mm -hmm. And 
it's I think what often happens is maybe because of the genuine existence of people making the less plausible claim somewhere. And also because sometimes people say things which are ambiguous between like something plausible, like Liam, you're participating in imperialism in the sense of giving Shelby P your money, and Liam, you're participating in imperialism insofar as you secretly you approve of Shelby P even if you don't say so. Mm. Uh, you know, they say things which are ambiguous because people don't bother to like separate those things out in normal conversation, maybe even sometimes in academic papers when they probably should. Mm. And then you can sort of generate kind of concern and, and worry, but but actually it's fine. Like, well, it's not fine. <laughs> well, it's full of bad things and that's not fine. But actually people aren't saying unreasonable things here. We could have a conversation. We just need to be charitable with each other and, and see right. what it becomes. Okay, and, and again, like, so I, as I, the, I, I don't, if the people in questions perspectives I'm coming from because again I'm not the uh, the expert on it they might even agree with you I know that Jim has talked about how important social justice is it's just sort of been taken to an nth degree on well particularly online but in in places like Portland and with Antifa and and you know things like that like they, they kind of that's the that's the extreme right and so I yeah I I think it's interesting is what I'm hearing is sort of the is versus ought like here's what it is here is the legacy of i'm guessing is it a is that like a petrol gasoline yes, station? Yes. Shelby it's, it's, okay i'm just trying to yeah. you know translate okay so so going through their legacy talking about it being from nigeria and like obviously colonialism and stealing um resources and blah blah, blah. It, it it that's just a, a history lesson yeah. and that's what is and then I guess it's where the ought, like, well, what ought we do? And that, yeah. and I, and I think that I'll, I will, I will say this, and because I, I felt this push is like a lot of people who have been, sorry, I shouldn't even say people. So I'll use. So for me, I felt a sort of pendulum swing when I was listening to a lot of the early IDW stuff about like Jordan Peterson a little bit, like Dave Rubin a bit, like talking about like oh there like there's this sort of perspective that there is using stats and I don't know them all so I'm not even going to pretend like I can say them like the, oh there's there's no more systematic racism left in the United States and that was again and that was from a black man Larry Elder to you know um Dave Rubin and so that was one of the Dave says that was the first time that he was like oh because he couldn't come up with a specific example not that there aren't he just couldn't come up with it, right? But I, I again, when you don't, when you're just, it was when you're, like, I was just, like, watching these. No idea about them, any of them. Like, I mean, I mean in Canada, we don't really have, we have uh, sort of stuff with uh, First Nations or the Indigenous people here. That's our thing that we kind of have to sort of reconcile. But we don't have, like, we didn't have slaves, so we don't have that legacy, you know? I just, I'm just watching these videos, taking them like, oh, okay, you know, mm. and and I was just like, okay, so I believe that, you know, and, and like like I I actually you know like I, it took me sort of like chatting with a couple friends who were like of a younger like be like, hey, like did you guys know? Oh, I said, I said, okay. yeah, and, well, I I didn't say it like that. I I you know I'm all like I I, I thought it made I had a way that it made sense. And it's sort of coming off of that, you know, watching, again, sort of like Steven Pinker be interviewed about his uh, Enlightenment. Enlightenment now. Enlightenment now, yeah. It's the best it's ever been. So I was really, like, buying into that. And so it's not that it, he's wrong. It's just I sort of made some assumptions like, oh, so therefore, not that there's no more racism, but there must not be that much. And mm. and so it could have been a lot of misunderstandings. And so like it, it, again, it's so naive and 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 I guess ignorant, you know. But it, it was a space that I had to kind of understand. No, you can't just say, well, it isn't, because because of what is being said on this side. So a, a lot of people, I'm gonna guess, might have that space that I was in, who don't look further. And so I kind of was able to go through this. Oh no, like just say what is that. It's not scary. Let's just say what is, and 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 so there's a lot of problems solved for me. Like, oh, okay, so let's just not deny what is still a thing, and then there's the well, what ought we do about those is's, mm -hmm. and and I think that's where a lot of the disagreement comes. Is like, oh yeah. So I've been going on a while, so I'm gonna let you respond. 
No, certainly. I mean, I, I think that uh, I... So I don't know where to begin. Let me, I'll say a few things. So, um, I was very vulnerable there with my journey. That's <laughs> okay. It was, uh, it was interesting to hear. But so my sense is that, uh, yes, were we to get to discussions of, okay, it does not, no reasonable theory of how one can fairly come to acquire things would say that Shell BP fairly acquired the oil in Nigeria. Well, the, right. the oil in Nigeria that they own. I don't think anybody disputes that. I mean, presumably lawyers for Shell BP would dispute that, but okay. no one who's being paid to dispute that would dispute that. Um, so that that's not an issue. Well, we can argue, therefore, that what are the consequences of that going forward? And I think that would be a productive argument to have. You know, I, I have certainly have my preferences and I have beliefs what would be good. I might be wrong. We should discuss them. Um, I, I my fear about a lot of the online culture right now is that it actively prevents us getting to a stage. And let, uh, let me be vulnerable. Well, let me at least tell my own story. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. Vulnerable. I, I, you come at me. Um, so uh, for a long time, I simply couldn't understand what the IDW crowd were doing because I recognized it as something and I use IDW quite loosely so it might okay. be I'm it was sort of a broader reaction movement against... yes again yeah it was very reactionary because people were seeing things that you know it was Will Peterson Bill C-16 talking about how you have like you compelled speech that was that was at that That's level yeah in government yeah so where I could recognize this as a kind of a broadly political movement. Often, for instance, uh, there was some involvement in things like uh, what should free speech laws be, and that seems to be a sort of recognize the political movement. But then the discussions people were having online seemed to me sort of very far removed, right? Because I would think of a political discussion as broadly in terms of, you know, okay, well, here are the policy options, here are what the consequences would be, which do we, which do we want to endorse? How could we move towards that? What would be effective? That kind of thing. But rather the discussions were often at this quite high level of abstraction. People were discussing things like, you know, this is ultimately how you discover discover what's true or um, what kind of a thing is mathematics? Is it uh, imbued with the evil essence of the white man or something? No, it's certainly not. People were saying, and et cetera. So it seemed like, it seemed like a political movement in one sense but focusing on issues which were sounded more like philosophy class issues, like some kind of thing I would discuss in kind of quite abstract classes, mm -hmm. and so and that was that was confusing to me for a while. Okay. And and actually, I came to believe that I think the model people have, or at least that many are working with, I can't say how many, um, is something along the lines of first we need to settle these like high abstract issues and only then could we move on to having a policy discussion like like look none of us can agree on what we should do about the oil in nigeria and i said we can agree officers would have to be including the people in nigeria would have to be the most important participants in the conversation but in any case like to have a conversation maybe sort of more closer to home so none of us can agree about what i don't know i'm thinking the, about like even like reparations that's a discussion sure, right, right now okay, well, yeah. So no one, none of us can agree what reparations policy should be, if there should be a reparations policy, unless we first agree how it is that we discover what's true about the history of the United States. And in order to do that, we need to agree on enlightenment principles or something along those lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the reason like we seem like a political movement and yet we're having these very abstract discussions is we just think that's a necessary like first step in having the political discussion. So that came to be the my understanding of what was going on. And I just think that's a bad model of politics. Okay. Like if we try, as a philosophy professor, if we try and first settle the philosophical issues and then have the policy discussion, that is a way of never having the policy discussion. Like that is- <laughs> Cause philosophy, yeah, it's never, it will, I mean, Plato <laughs> is a long time ago and there were even people before him, so. Exactly, right, exactly, right. We're still having some of the discussions which were had then because it just turns out that like, clever, reasonable people can come up with things to say on behalf of a lot of different ideas. And like, we're not going to settle that on the kind of time frame okay. you need to. And it's so the, it's I, the culture war, it's, but it's like this culture. It's the cult. So, so that's why I don't even consider the things I talk about are very sort of to do with all these things, but I don't consider like myself a political 
space. I mean, there are sometimes politics discussed. I, I, I see it more as like the culture wars or like what's going on culturally. And that's what you're describing in the sort of metaphysical, philosophical space. Yeah, exactly. I okay. think that people are sort of, a, a tr sort of the, the culture, the, the relationship between the culture war and direct policy is meant to be, we need to settle the culture war issues in order to do the policy. That's my sense. Now, I am imputing this. No, you're right. Maybe no, like... no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> and, correct. And yeah. so I, I, I just sort of... I think we should move away from that model. Now, I will say, actually, here's one thing I know I do know about Peterson. Peterson, I will say, to be fair to him, is actually quite explicit about this. So Peterson's model is that you should first s sort out yourself, mm -hmm. like get your own soul in order, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on to do policy things. But like probably that's a lifetime's work. So you should just like, don't worry about your the broader world. You need to work on yourself and like make yourself a better person. You'll okay. at least be better for the people around you so i think he's quite explicit that first you like decide on these issues about how you're going to approach the world and that's probably a lifetime's work and good for you and that's what you're doing so i think he's explicit so i, I just don't know if i'm right in imputing other people i'm glad you seem to agree now i think instead of that well it's we not individuals it's it's collective it's sort of a collective we've kind of i haven't been able to um parse it out that way but i would agree i would never have even thought to stop with that part of it to do policy and a lot of people I think haven't even thought of it in those terms and you've sort of you've sort of well we've reduced it to what is what is happening versus you know so many people don't know what what is happening here you know you just were in it so you've kind of looked at it and you've kind of drawn a bit of a map well uh, right, ho hopefully um well okay so what do we so what do we do what's what is well if it's that's bad what it would be good so, so my sense is that we should draw on ideas. This is actually from a philosopher who normally I don't like because I'm a sort of, I'm an old school lefty and this person's far too liberal, but okay. okay. Um, so there's a philosopher, John Rawls, um, who has this idea of overlapping consensus. And what his idea is that in a liberal society, there's going to be a lot of disagreement about how the world is and how we should approach it. Okay. And that's a permanent feature, but that's never going away. That 100%, just, yeah. When you agree to a liberal site, that's the thing you agree to. What we should work out is within the, cons like, although there's a lot of disagreement, you can find some, like, overlap between the views which can motivate cooperative action, even despite the fact you don't agree on those broad cultural or metaphysical or epistemological principles. Okay. And you should try and discuss, like, okay, where do our principles lead us to to shared projects? Okay. So I, this is more in the context of the United States than... Uh, than Canada, which I can't speak as much of Canada. Well, I mean, but I know... there's not much going on here, so. <laughs> yeah. No, there are. No, there are some things going on in certain universities. and But anyway, you were saying. Okay, so I, um, so like take in the United States, I think I'm worth, is campaign finance laws in the United States. So they're obviously, the United States is famously a very polarized democracy right now. Mm -hmm. But it is actually a matter of broad consensus amongst everyone who's not a millionaire that the way in which millionaires can funnel infinite money into U.S. politics is is not good. Like okay. polling consistently shows support for like that should be restrained. Like the role of lobbyists is far too they're far too powerful in the American political system. Now that's not actually because people agree on why. Like if you ask oh, okay. kind of socialist lefties what the problem is, it'll be different from if you ask people who think there's who people have like QAnon esque conspiracy theories about George Soros. But there is nonetheless agreement, despite these very different worldviews, that like, here is something which we agree on, we can act on. Okay, and I think if, that sounds so nice. And, but, if, 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 but, we, but we'll never get to it. And indeed, in this case, I think there are, there's a lot of incentive to ensure we don't get to it. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we can just spend forever arguing about, like, we know it's good, but why should we do it? And we'll never settle that. There's no way that you're going to get the socialist lefty types like me to agree to what the QAnon people think. I think it's wild. And they're never going to agree to what I think. They think I'm a, you know, funded by evil kajillionaires myself. Okay. So like, we're never going to agree on that. And that's just pointless. Like, okay. But nonetheless, there's action we could take. And, and I think that's my example. Now, I should say, I said very confidently that there's overlapping consensus. And I recall there being overlapping consensus. But that's the kind of thing I should have looked up before you I said it there's... from the well, I do so, know, I do know everyone does think with regards to the Epstein suicide. 
Oh, yeah. They go. Everyone <laughs> agrees Seems that like there's something there. Yeah? yeah. I mean, some say the, so the Clintons, others say the Trumps, some say the Russians. But you but, know what? But, it, we all agreed. It exactly. So there's a the case where like, there is a broad agreement that there should, in fact, be further investigation. Mm -hmm. We do not have to agree on who we think it's likely will be found out should this investigation carry on. Mm -hmm. We just there is broad. So like, there's a good example. Right. And uh, if we just argue about the, the deeper causes, what will happen is we'll never agree to them. Coordinated action won't occur. And a bunch of billionaire pedophiles are going to get away with it. Right. Um, yes. And so and, I, I think yeah, that's the problem. Mm hmm. So, so, so my sense is, if if you were to make me dictator of the world, I would probably do more things than just reform how we talk on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But when I got round to reforming how we, how and we you'd talk be a benevolent Twitter, dictator, would you not? <laughs> well, now I'm now I don't have the power. I feel compelled to agree, but wait okay. till I get that. <laughs> You're like I know too much. I know what power does. It corrupts. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'd, I'd use it for sort of entirely petty things. Okay. Like increase the production of Afro combs. Okay. But, um, <laughs> okay, we've got that out of the way. But, like, but, you know, w w when I would get around to sort of legislating how we all talk on Twitter, I would say, you know, it, it's perfectly fine to sort of have one's metaphysical discussions. I'm a philosophy professor. I love those discussions. But reserve some time and some space for, like, talking about concrete policy and mm. how what should be done and, and how we could go about doing it mm. because i think that if the discussion were had in that way i mean cards on the table like i think a lot of scaremongering about the the evils of the applied postmodernists would, would would actually be reduced massively because it would be found that what they're saying is far from the unreasonable scary thing it's alleged to be right. now you know of course that that's my bet i, I realize your, your subscribers are unlikely to agree, but we should try to experiment. And I, well, be... it's not you're I mean, I think that it's pretty concrete that you're saying about like if we want to move forward with policies that are sound and agreed with on all sides, uh, you know, uh, we've got to and we came up with one, the Epstein case. <laughs> so I mean, we, we've got to do some work. And it's all, and I, honestly, a lot of it is is Trump being in office, yeah. right? Yeah. Because um, that's caused a lot of division. And I mean, I've spoken to some people who are like, "Oh no, it was like eight years of Obama, and then finally whatever." But like, nah, like Trump is unique. He is un like, I mean, Obama was a politician. Trump isn't. That's the point. So, so actually, while, while I'm here, yeah, I'm just. As, you know, hopefully, I'm, I hope it will be good for your channel if I generate a lot of angry responses. In well, the, you know what? The... Uh, no, is it, what is it like? No publicity is bad publicity. Exactly. It's like, you, know, <laughs> um, you know, fame, infamy, it matters not. What matters mm -hmm. is that I'm um, you oh, know, yeah, that's a the better version of what so, I said. Yeah. Uh, that's the spirit of social media, at least. <laughs> um, so, so just while I'm here, here's the thing which often bothers me in the, the IDW sphere uh, in North America. Um, no, I said North America, that's actually not what I should have said. In the United States, it is different in Canada. Um, in the United States, there's often this perception, often reinforced, I think, by how people discuss things in the IDW world, that kind of there's the sort of the all-conquering hegemonic left, and it's being like the, the – and what we're doing is sticking up for kind of – free expression by sticking up for the sort of the somewhat put upon conservatives and whatnot. But I, I just think this sort of this massively underweights the fact that most and most powerful political offices are held by people who are very right wing relative to the global standard and even the historical standard of the United States. Um, many industries are like very much kind of broadly sympathetic to right wing aims. Like I can guarantee you there weren't many people voting for Bernie Sanders in the finance industry, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, and what's more, like, um, large sections of the judiciary in the United States are sort of, there's a kind of a well-oiled machine for ensuring that conservative voices are represented and often make their way into high office or high seat. I don't know how you say it in the judiciary world. In any case, I, I don't understand this kind of perception of things that there's the hegemonic left and the plucky underdog right wing and we as centrists just want to ensure there's debate by getting the right wing. It seems to me that you just have control over different industries by different sections of the population. And the industries which have the most direct formal power, they're the ones which are largely controlled by the right. 
it's Trump and whatnot. And so insofar as there's panic on the left, it's because they where they're concentrated is in industries which are kind of vulnerable to the other ones. Okay. So I, I think I, I do often think that the characterization of the the status of the culture war in in America is 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 very un very far from the facts on the ground of the actual distribution of power in America. Okay, I do have some answers that I'm pretty sure my audience are like <laughs> screaming. Yeah, but I mean, again, it, it's not. <laughs> It's not that this, whatever, it's, it's not that like more right versus less, less right. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say right. More correct versus less correct. You're correct on all the things you said. Those are like, those are the is is. Like, that's what is for sure. Although there is Silicon Valley, which is. Oh, no, no. There are certainly industries which will like go left or center. Left, right. right. And, 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 and But they the were really, really like, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like. Those are huge powers in the world because of social media's power that they would say, like, maybe even more than the finance industry. I don't know. Well, some I, I'm not saying I don't think that necessarily, but that could be argued uh, that Silicon Valley is more powerful than Wall Street. I don't know. I don't really know that actually at all. But but I, I'm wondering if that might be something that could become whatever. And again, it doesn't this to this fact that there's a lot of power in Silicon Valley doesn't mean there's less power in Washington, mm -hmm. like in DC, you know, it just, it just, that, that, that's, that's one little like, Oh, well there is that. And then I think because a lot of like, yes, there's Fox news, but then there's most of the rest are pretty left. So the narrative that's being um, pushed is like a, Again, I'm just I just I know the I've I've asked these things before because I've said exactly what you said. I listed all the power in on the right. And then people have said, well, but the narrative and whoever controls the narratives are who has the like the power. And 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 that is something that's interesting because if you think about who who typically wants censorship, those who are in control of a narrative, like like McCarthyism, you mentioned that earlier. That was super right wing, <laughs> and they were said they wanted to censor because they were the ones who held that control of that like narrative in the United States, and so that's what this is what someone has like, argued to me as to why it's the people who are kind of leaning right or or just right who are like yeah freedom of speech yeah you know because they're like the you know but again I mean Fox News is huge. So I don't think we should underplay that as like a little piddly nothing, you know, and the kind of there's the Daily Wire, too, and all these other, you know, conservatives. So I, I don't disagree with you um, at all, but it's just people would and, say those things I just said. And what I'm and this is, I think, sort of endemic. And I, I'm sure, actually, I'm going to admit that I've been culpable of the thing I'm about to say. It's. As a, as a lefty, it's always very salient to me that kind of there are divisions on the left which matter here. So take, for instance, free speech in companies. I'm sure there's the, another recent Twitter thing. I won't lie too much. I shouldn't be about <laughs> yeah. it. But I feel like anyone who does a PhD just makes bad life choices. So like a, and no, there's um, so... <laughs> no. Like, I, um, there's the, the bar stool owner, the owner of that company, um, went on Twitter and said he would fire any of his workers who yes, said they were going to form a union. Form and a union, so right. often, if you're a kind of lefty of a certain sort, actually free speech protections seem important because we don't feel that we're the ones with the power. We're on the side of the people who don't own the stuff against the people who own the stuff. Oh, yeah. And we want the people who don't own the stuff to be protected from the from this kind of tyranny. Um, and likewise, um, the NYT, which is like a powerful uh, liberal organization, certainly is center-left relative to America. That, that I would no dispute that. But if you see their coverage of like sort of DSA or socialist candidates, even Bernie, um, it's, it, could, it couldn't be called friendly. Like it, it's not like they they like that sort of thing either. So there are divisions within... It's true. There's establishment versus anti-establishment <laughs> candidates. I agree. Because and even Google... Um, like, I think Tulsi Gabbard is suing Google. I can't remember why. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember why. But, like, I mean, it, it, it's because she's not establishment. And right. um, so, yeah, there's almost a sort of left and right and then, like, the establishment and then the non-establishment. And... Yeah, so kind of separate but, 
system. Oh, sorry, what? In a kind of separate axis. So yes, it's, yeah, and 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 so I think that, and that's the thing is like on the right, Trump is is anti-establishment, so they're like, yay. We needed that. <laughs> well, well, people, workers I, voted for him. People, like, people who probably had voted Democrat their whole lives in the Rust Belt probably voted for him. Not probably, they did because of that. I, I think that that was the big surprise, right? That's why Hillary didn't even go there because it's so Democrat. It's so working class Democrat there. And then they, vote, you know, voted for him. So that's the problem is there. I, I, I mean, the, the whole drain the swamp thing, even though, like, still waiting on that. Like, still waiting. Well, I mean, I, I think it's kind of, it's an interesting phenomena that people, uh, that people can still maintain a kind of line of themselves as anti-establishment, even when they are a, a, a billionaire president. I mean, you know, <laughs> I sure would love to be anti-establishment. Yeah. But, but you're yeah. right, like, that is like the perception being sold, and I'm sure some people are attracted to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um all, all I wish to say um, on this point is that s s I'm often kind of frustrated, I should say, when I encounter people who, you know, say it's not that I am necessarily against left wing ideas. I'm I'm a centrist. It's just I feel that currently the left are hegemonic and the right aren't. And first, but can you explain well, what hegemonic means? Because I don't oh, know the what left, it is. like powerful in a great many institutions such that like if we're going to stick up for the, like the balance that needs to be struck is the right need to be made a bit bigger in order to counterbalance the left okay okay and i think like firstly like it's a much more complicated situation than that and secondly even within the kind of apparently left-wing institutions for instance the media empires which aren't fox and they are and whatnot like often you'll find the version of left wing they are is like pretty establishment. It's but like, you know, some diversity touches around the edges, but not really changing anything fundamental. In fact, I just got a really cute message from my my fiance. It's adorable. Um, but like, it, it, like um, okay. even my sense actually of what happened to Evergreen, my my conjecture, and it was an ignorant conjecture, but it, my conjecture is that what the student organizers eventually found is that the apparently on their team saying some left-wing administrati administrators weren't really, it was more like the NYT. It was some, it was a pleasant PR around the basically establishment group trying to do basically establishment things. Okay. And the administration was like running into this. And it could be, you know, like, it, yeah, yeah, it could, I, yeah, it, it could be. And that's hard to know those motivations. Um, no, I, I can't. Really, really, I should stress. I mean, if you're going to talk to Benjamin Boyce, of course, I'm going to disagree with his take on things, but he's much more informed than me. So right, we'll yeah. Well, on. well, you should watch. The, I would. Well, you know, it's so funny. I was like, I wanted to talk with you about the what role scientific evidence can uh, or should play in guiding policy. But uh, you know, we were. We yeah. out of time. Well, I, oh, I, I mean, sorry. I would be more interested if you if you ever do like. If you watch any of these documentaries that I was chatting with, with you about, or I want to hear more about your take on critical race theory. And we don't have time. Like, I just, we don't have time. It's just, it's, it's been too long. <laughs> I, I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll give you my take. I'm in favor, you know. Okay. <laughs> well, I know, but, but, but to me, but like, I've heard such negative things. And a lot of the people watching have heard such negative things. So I really want to know. And I, I, don't go into it now because I don't want to do it quick. I want to. I do want to talk with you. I, I mean, if you allow, again at some point, and maybe we can hear some feedback, better reasonings or explanations than I gave. You know, and I could bring these things up if people leave feedback about like, oh, Andrea, like almost did, but like, you missed this point as to and ask ask Liam this or whatever. But it, I've heard all these, all the people, many people watching and, and then me, like I've heard only negative things, except for maybe I've heard like a positive, some positive like about postmodernism, why it does make sense to critique overarching narratives. That's not bad, you know, like I've heard some, and then like the, again, like these grievance studies guys, like they're like, yeah, all fours like, getting justice to the downtrodden, but they see the critical race and like the, the gender studies and fat studies and all these different created like more recent departments, they don't they 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 see them the problems within them. And so um I would like to hear your take on 
why you think they're being mischaracterized. Sure. Well, I mean, of course, what I could do is stick up for what I believe. I can't defend what other people believe in other places. Right. But I'm, I'm happy to come back on and say why I think some version of these theories are true and what my reasons are. Okay, because I really do want to get a viewpoint diversity here, because that's one of the critiques of the IDW, is that they, they like, get, a, 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 I guess, a viewpoint diversity from, you know, people who are like, oh, I'm, I... Like in the real world, like, like in their voting, what the things they would vote for in an election, it's quite diverse. But on these topics, again, this is a critique. Is like that this is that they, they kind of get the same people on the same topic, even if they have different views on other things out in the world. But on like the freedom of speech and right. this sort of far left. Um, problems that they're concerned about um, seeing with protests and whatnot across college campuses across um, the, the U.S. and Canada. Like, so the, the mostly similar takes. And I mean, that, that's a critique. If they, well, I'm not going to like, if they want to explain why they do think it's diverse, fine. But like, but for me, I know personally, I haven't had a ton of diverse views. And so that's why I do want to start doing that more. And um, and I don't want to debate. I just want to hear. And I have people exposed to different ideas. And I wanted to talk about Marx, but we didn't. <laughs> okay. Oh, well. well. So many things! Why, why are you so smart and, like, well-rounded, Liam? So many things I want to talk to you about. I'm, I'm sure that's not true. But, oh, like, okay. but thank well, I'm sure it is, but okay. Um, th thank you. I'd be happy to talk again. Thanks for coming on. This is great. My pleasure.